Isaiah chapter 6 and the first 10 verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne and his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. One each, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am, send me. And he replied, Go. Say to these people, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Dull the minds of these people, deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. See, Isaiah was given a destiny to go and tell the people what they needed to hear. And even though they would not listen, even though they could not listen because their, their hearing had been deafened, their eyes had been blinded, he was still, it was his destiny to go and, and tell the people what God was saying in, in Israel in that day. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you open our eyes that we might see and open our ears that we might hear. Father, that we might hear your word and it come alive in us today. We might see the glory of God filling the earth. Be able to walk in that glory and be able to, 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 to lead people into the kingdom of God that they might also see and hear. Father, if there's any blinders on our eyes or things stopping up our ears in the name of Jesus, I take authority over it and I remove it that the word might come alive in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, starting with the third verse down through verse 17. Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 17. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky ground where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched since they had no root, they withered. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop, some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. Anyone who has ears should listen. Then the disciples came up and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered them, Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. 
Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says you will listen and listen, yet never understand. And you will look and look, yet never perceive. For the people's heart has grown callous. Their ears of hard of hearing, they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn back, and I would cure them. But your eyes are blessed because they do see, and your ears because they do hear. For I assure you, many prophets and righteous people long to see the things you see, yet didn't see them, to hear the things you hear, yet didn't hear them. See, blessed are your eyes and ears that they see and they hear. Blessed are your eyes and your ears that they see and they hear. It's important. It's important, folks, that we see what's going on, that we hear what God is saying. Because God will speak the answers to all the problems. He will speak the answer to every question we have. He will speak to the answer as to what to do to, to heal our nation. He'll speak the answer to what to do to heal your relationships. He'll speak the answer. He'll speak it to you directly if you'll just listen to him. We spend so much time listening to what the internet has to say, which is mostly garbage anyhow. We spend time listening to what, what the, 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 the news media says, and, and we've been told over and over again, they're lying to you, but we listen. We listen to what our friends say because they read this or that or the other thing and and they thought it was good so they sent it to you and, and, and we listen. But then when we when it comes to our Heavenly Father, well I, I don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna say this quick little prayer and be done, you know, and, and do my do my one page devotional today. And then, and then God and I will be copacetic. Well, not exactly. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Well, but pastor, I have to go to work. Well, pray without ceasing. But pastor, don't you understand? I have to focus on my work. Yes, okay, pray without ceasing. Well, I, I can't do that. I, I don't know how to do that. How can I do that? How can I pray without ceasing? I'm not, I'm not in the ministry. I, oh, you're not a Christian then? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I, I'm a Christian. If you're a Christian, you have been called to be in the ministry. Now, that doesn't mean a pulpit ministry. It doesn't mean a, a ministry <coughs> where you've got to Get all dressed up and, and, and impress people. You can see I'm all dressed up today. I'm impressing people. <laughs> Anyhow, see, folks, we need to understand a lot of times the gospel tells better in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt than it does in a suit and tie because we live in a jeans and T-shirt era. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that's the way, that's what we live in. You know, and and um, there's a lot of people who listen to you better if you're in a jeans and T-shirt than you are in a suit and tie. But the more important thing is you are called to be a minister of the gospel. If you are a Christian, you have been called. Well, well, how do I do that? Well, you just tell people what you know. If you're born again, you know how to get born again. You can tell somebody else. If you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you know how you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Tell somebody so they get baptized in the Holy Ghost. 
If you've been baptized with fire, you already know the things I'm telling you. But you need to listen to what the Father's telling us. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. And we need to take time to listen. And if you can't hear, then pray that your ears be unstopped so that you can hear. It's so important for your life, folks. You have a destiny as a believer. If you go to John chapter 12, and we're going to start with the 35th verse, down through verse 50. John chapter 12, verses 35 through 50. Jesus answered, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Jesus said this and went away and hid from them. Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. But this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet who said, Lord, who has believed our message? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? This is why they were unable to leave, believe because Isaiah also said he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and be converted, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many did believe in him, even among the rulers, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, so they would not be banned from the synagogue. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, the one who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't accept my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his command is eternal life. So the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. We are children of the light and not children of the darkness. And, 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 and we need to walk as children of light because Jesus within us has given us his light for this world. I mean, you don't have to look very far to see darkness. I'm not talking about in the physical sense. I'm talking about in the spiritual sense. I mean, just look at the news reports, the darkness and the gross darkness that covers the earth. Gross darkness, horrible, horrible things. Hor murdering babies and, 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 and people accepting that and promoting it. It's 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 a it's a terrible thing, folks. It's a terrible thing. And 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 I could go on and on and on and on and on with the with the gross darkness that's covering the earth. But we have to walk in the light. We have to learn to walk as Jesus walked in the light, 
because your light will draw people out of the darkness. See, darkness never overcomes light. Light always overcomes darkness. You say, well, what, what are you talking about, Pastor? You walk into a dark room and turn on a light. And, and the electricity flows into that little bulb. And it begins to glow. And the darkness recedes and goes away. Why? Because the light will always overtake the darkness. And if you are the light of the world, then, then the darkness that you encounter will be lightened. And people will see the light. And just as moths come to the light at night, people will come to your light. They will see your light and come to it. You know, this window behind me, I have to keep closed now because my son's dog tore the screen out of it. And we had the window open. And at night, I had the light on. First thing I know, I, I could see little lights flashing in the room. And I, at first, I wondered, what is, why am I seeing lights flash? And then I realized that lightning bugs were coming in through this this window behind me that was open with no screen. The lightning bugs came in to the light in this room, and then they were flashing their little tails all over the room. So I had to shut the window because the the the, the bugs were being drawn to the light. And I'm telling you folks, if you walk in the light without a screen, you can't put up a screen. You know, you, you have to have a smile on your face. You have to have you have to have the joy of the Lord bubbling up inside of you. And as you walk in the light, the light will draw the people out of the darkness. And they will come to you. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14, the words backing up what I said. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. For you were once darkness, but now you're in the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light results in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but ex instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made clear. For what makes everything clear is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, rise up from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. Rise up, sleeper, rise up, sleepers, and shine in the light. Because the light of the Lord has risen up upon you. The glory of God is within you because his Holy Spirit resides in you and with his Holy Spirit comes his glory. So rise up. And let the glory of the Lord shine forth from you to this world. See, You'll stumble in the darkness. And I, I touched on this a little bit ago, but I want to I go forward with it. There are a lot of voices in this world, a lot of voices. And, and if you listen to them, you may miss the voice of God. You know, and, and there's so many voices in the world. There's, I mean... In the spirit realm, there's, there's a lot of voices. You know, there, there are demonic voices. There are satanic voices. 
There are angelic voices. There's the voice of God speaking. And and you remember when Elijah went to the went to the uh, brook sheriff and was in the cave and 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 there was a tremendous storm. But he didn't hear the voice of God. And there was a fire, but he didn't hear the voice of God. But then God spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. God doesn't yell at us. He doesn't scream at us. Many voices in the world do. They yell and scream trying to hide the voice of God. But see, God spoke to Elijah in a still small voice and told Elijah what he should do, where he should go, how he should live. And see, if we start listening to all the voices in the world, we'll, we may miss the voice of God. Oh, there's some people, you know, that there's a storm. I mean, everything's got to be their way. And, it, it, you know, and, and they, they just blow and blow and blow. And there's some people have a fire. Wrong kind of fire. You know, you see them marching in the streets. You see them destroying property. You see them, you see them, screaming and yelling and hollering and oh it's it's got to be their way but see if we listen to the storm if we listen to the fire we may miss the voice of god so it's important to listen to the voice of god he is residing within us and, and we have to know what our destiny is in order to be able to fulfill it. You have to know your destiny to fulfill it. Just like when you go to work in the morning, if you walk into your, to your office or your place of work, and you, you don't know what to do, you have to listen to the voice of your boss to know what it is you're supposed to do that day. You know, for a very, very short time, I, I worked in a factory many years ago where we made, um, we made sterile drapes that, for doctors to use in surgery. And, of course, you know, heart surgery, the drape had to be open in the, in the chest area. Abdominal surgery, it had to be open in the abdomen. Leg surgery, it had to be open in the leg. And so we would go in in the morning, and, and the boss would give us the instructions for the day of how to cut the drapes a certain way because that's the kind of drape we were making that day. And we had this this long table, probably, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet long. And at the end of it were eight or 10 rolls of paper. And we would take the ends of that paper and we would carry it and walk up the table and lay it down go back and cut it off, pick up the ends, go up, lay it down, go back, cut off the ends, and so forth, until we had a stack maybe 10 inches to a foot high of this paper. And then we had a saw that was made to cut that paper, and we would lay out the templates and cut the paper the way we were supposed to do it that day. But they had to tell us every day what it was we were supposed to do that day. Now, that didn't carry over till tomorrow. 
That was that day. And then the next morning we had to listen so that we knew which templates to use to, to cut the paper. And, and then and this paper would go into a room where it was sterilized and packaged in sterile packaging and sent off to hospitals, doctors, offices, wherever it was sent uh, for surgical drapes. But every day we had to have the instruction of what to do for that day. And we had to listen to what our boss had to say. I couldn't listen to that radio that was blaring down the aisle. I had to listen to what my boss had to say. Amen. We have to listen every day to what God has to say so that we know what to do that day. Because tomorrow it might change. You know, it's, today might be the day that you go out to the street and 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 talk to people or hand out tracts or pray for people or whatever. And tomorrow it might be that you call these friends or these these folks that you know that you and witness to them. And then the next day it might be go to your to your neighbor and and take them a loaf of bread, and and sit and and, and have some coffee and toast together or whatever. But see, every day it will change, and you have to listen to the voice of the Father. Jesus said, "I only speak what I heard the Father tell me to speak." In John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus replied, I assure you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son also does these things in the same way. And in John chapter 8, verse 28, he said, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the father taught me, I say these things. See, as we listen to the father, we'll be able to do the things that Jesus did. We'll be able to, to do what he did. You say, well, does that mean that I'll be able to walk on the water? If necessary, yes. Does that mean that I'll be able to heal the sick? Yes. Not that you do the healing. The Father does the healing. The Son does the healing. All you are is just the, the, the instrument that he uses on this earth. You know, when I lay hands on people and they get healed... I don't do any healing. There, there's nothing in these hands that would heal a, 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 a gnat. There's just nothing there. But when the Spirit of God is flowing through them, suddenly they become powerful and people get healed. Amen. And God will tell you how to pray for people. I've, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. I was in a service um, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And as we were in praise and worship, at the beginning of the service, I was praising God, worshiping. And, and something was catching my attention. And it was a young girl who sat and, and, and she just... She rocked back and forth, rocked back and forth, just rock and rock. And then she, all, every once in a while, she would yell something indiscernible. It, it wasn't, it wasn't language. It wasn't even Portuguese language. It was just a, a yell. And uh, I mean, it, it wasn't hard to tell that the young lady was 
severely um, uh, um, disabled. We'll, we'll go with that word. So, you know, I, I finally got called up to preach and I was preaching and the whole time I'm preaching, she's sitting there rocking and every, every now and then she'd yell and her parents were trying to shush her up and, you know, it was a little distracting and I thought, man, I got to pray for this girl. And when I thought that, when I thought, I've, I've got to pray for her, the Lord said, not now. Okay. So I kept going, kept preaching. And I finished my message, and I gave an altar call for people to be saved. And so people came and, and, and received Jesus. And she's still rocking. And I'm thinking, i got to pray for her. So I gave an altar call for healing, and people lined up and and I'm wanting to go pray for her. And the Lord said, not now. Okay. So I started praying for people and people were getting healed. Immediately. Blind people received sight. Deaf people received hearing. Lame people walked. It was a great healing service. I mean, people just got healed. And the whole time I'm thinking, I got to pray for this girl. And the Lord kept saying, not now. So I would keep praying for other people. Finally, I finished and I'm all done. And the Lord said, okay, now. And I had every intention of walking over and just laying hands on her. And as I walked over to her, the Lord said, give her a hug. Oh, a hug. And he had told me that before. In fact, he had me hug a lady, an old lady that had AIDS and she got healed. In the same service. And so I reached down to where she was sitting and I, I just picked her up. She wasn't. She was maybe 12 years old. Uh, she wasn't very big. I just picked her up and I'm holding her in a hug. And at first she resisted. And the Lord said, cast out the devil that is tormenting her. And I did. And she relaxed. And then I began to pray over her brain and over her mind. And I could feel her whole body beginning to relax as I held her in my arms. And she totally relaxed. She totally was at peace. Her legs straightened out because when I first picked her up, her body was, was curled. Her legs straightened out, her, her arms went down. And I just held her there. And I prayed over her and I, I just allowed the Spirit of God to minister to her. And I finally, I, I took her and I, I set her back down on her chair and she sat up straight, her legs straight. And she looked over at her parents and she said, Mama. And the tears were streaming down the parents' face because they had their daughter restored to them. Had I done that in my own power, I, I don't have power like that in myself. <laughs> I have I, I have a sermon that I've preached in the past, and I, I have the notes someplace, and it said, I am nothing, but I know that I am. I'm nothing, but I know the I am. 
And see, when you listen to the I am, he will tell you what it is you need to do and exactly how to do it. But you have to listen to him. <coughs> Let's get down to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start with the seventh verse, down through verse 11. Hebrews chapter what? 11, okay. verses 7 through 11. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark delivered his, to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, I, I saw an interesting thought on this. You know, and I always thought that Noah built the ark and, and he made it to the exact specifications that God told him to make. He used the, the, the right kind of wood. He used the, the right kind of pitch. He, he built it to the right size. And I always thought, well, you know, the ark was his safety. But if you read the account of Noah in Genesis, you see that even though Noah with his hands did all that, and, and, and you understand, Noah didn't know what rain was because up until that time it had not rained. The earth was watered by the dew that fell at night. Noah had no way of knowing that there were underground rivers and and springs. And he, he, I mean, he knew there were wells because they had to have water to drink. But he didn't know how that water got in the ground. He lived in the desert. He probably didn't know there was an ocean out there. Maybe he had heard stories of some traveler who said, I saw this body of water you couldn't see across. But he didn't know. He, Noah didn't know what a boat was. Nobody had ever built a boat in the desert. What's the point of it? But he built this with his hands, and, and the animals went in two by two, as God instructed them to do. Noah's family went in. Noah went in. But it wasn't until God himself shut the door and sealed it with his own seal. See, even though Noah had done all this work on his own, it wasn't until the hand of God sealed it that it became a place of safety. It became a place of salvation. And in our lives... We can do the work. You know, I can go someplace and preach the gospel by the inspiration of Holy Spirit. I can preach the gospel. I can tell you what the word of God says. But until God seals it, it doesn't become the place of salvation. I can go to the street and I can tell somebody that God loves them and Jesus died for them. 
and they need to accept Jesus into their life. They need to become intimate with Jesus. I can tell them all that. But God is the one that seals the salvation. Just as God was the one that sealed the door, the door on that ark of salvation. We don't know about Noah. You know, maybe he was a little dorky, but, you know. See, God had to seal the door of the ark for it to become a place of salvation. Let's move on here. Chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went out to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. In other words, no, uh, Abraham was looking forward to heaven. He was, he, was, he was looking forward to a heavenly life afterward, after this life was over. And I'm sure we're going to see Abraham when we get there. But he didn't even know where he was going or what he was doing. One night I was in the Dominican Republic and I had preached in the church, had a tremendous prophetic night. And a, a very prophetic night. And got in the pastor's car, and, and as his normal routine was, that after church, we would get in the car and we would go someplace to eat. Um, we got in the car, and he started driving through the city. And my interpreter said, I don't know where we're going or what we're doing. He hasn't said. And we drive up to this place, and, and uh, the house was sitting on a, oh, a really steep hill. And there was a, a concrete walkway, driveway. I don't know what it was. The concrete came down to the street. But, I mean, it was steep. And at the top of at this house, there was a big crowd of people. And I thought, oh, he's taking me to a party. Huh. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was the primary entertainment for the night. So my interpreter and I got out of the car, the pastor drives away. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, I don't know anything. I don't know one person up there. I don't know anybody. And there urging me to come up. So I came up and they had this big chair for me to sit in at the top so I didn't fall back down the hill. And I sat there and my interpreter was talking to the lady of the house and she came over to me. She said, Pastor, you're supposed to preach. And I'm thinking, well, I, I did preach. Why didn't they, why didn't they come to the church? Well, they don't have transportation to come to the church. So they brought in all their friends and neighbors here. And you're supposed to preach. And I thought, dear Lord Jesus, what am I supposed to preach now? And he began to give me a word. And I began to preach it. Not like Abraham, not knowing where he was going. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was going to do when he got there. He just knew he was supposed to go. Well, I I didn't know where I was. Didn't have a clue. And my transportation had driven away. Eventually, they came back. But as I began to preach the gospel, 
I preached a, a very simple salvation message, and I, I always try to put a salvation message in every sermon that I preach. And, and this is a good point for it, because if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, today is your day of salvation. Jesus died for you. God's not mad at you. He loves you. And he just wants to pour out his love on you. And all you need to do in order to receive everything that God has and become a joint heir with Jesus is to accept Jesus into your life as your personal Savior. Not just know about him, but actually know him because he, he has a desire to know you. He's known you since the cross. He's known you since eternity backwards. He's known you. Amen. And he's loved you. And he's wanted you to come to him. So today, today is your day of salvation. Today is the day to receive him as your personal savior. If you don't know how to do that, contact me. Contact me. I'm I'm on social media. I I'm, I've got chat rooms, WhatsApp, whatever. Contact me, and I will I will help you to pray to receive him. But then, see, as I preach this salvation message there at this hilltop house. There was a man down in the street on the other side of the street and he was trying to hide behind a telephone pole or electric pole or whatever it was. But he was trying to hide, but he was listening to what I said and God, and God pointed him out to me. And so I finished my message. I, I had preached a short message, and I finished. And the Lord said, call that man up here. So I said, sir, you, you, and I'm pointing at him, you, behind the pole there, come here. And my interpreter's interpreting. And he's like, me? You want, you want me? Yeah, you. Come here. And he came up. And I began to ask him questions. And no, he didn't know Jesus as his Savior. No. But I said, would you like to? And he said, yes. And we prayed together and he received Jesus as his personal savior. And he was so blessed and the people around were so blessed and they accepted him as a new brother. And I found out that he was a mechanic that lived down the street and had a mechanic shop at his house there. And, and, and so they, they kind of knew who he was and, and so forth, but that night he received Jesus and he became my brother and your brother if you're a Christian. And we're going to be together again someday. But see, I don't know. I, I Honestly, I don't know if anybody else in that house got anything out of it, but I know there was a man came to Christ that night and it was worth it to go out there. It was worth it. So sometimes you don't, you don't, we're like Abraham. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what to do when we're going to get there. All we know is we're supposed to go. And when we go, we're supposed to be obedient to do what God says to do. Abraham was sent out here and they said, oh, you're going to have a son. Really? I'm too old to have a son. Well, you're going to have one anyhow. Okay. 
All right, God, if it's okay with you, it's okay with me. How am I going to do this? Well, Sarah's going to have it. Well, wait a minute, Sarah. Sarah went through the change back, you know, decades ago. Yeah, well, Sarah's going to, Sarah's going to have a son. And you're going to call his name Isaac. Oh, okay. And as Abraham believed God, guess what? Abraham and Sarah had a son, and his name was Isaac. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was going to do. He just did it because God said to do it. And we have to be like that. Verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age since she considered the one who had promised was faithful. I'm telling you today, the one who promised is still faithful. He's faithful. He will, he will do what he says he will do. And if you will believe God, he will give you a promised land. He will... He, 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 I mean, Abraham even believed God when God said, okay, I want you to go sacrifice this son I've given you. Huh? Wait a minute. You told, you told me that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. Uh-huh. But sacrifice him. See, Abraham believed that Isaac would be raised from the dead when that, when that happened. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, faith comes by what you hear. And what you hear has to be what God says. Now, I realize that our world is ruled by time and the time is about up for this message, but I want to share a few more things with you if you'll just hang with me. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I have heard people say, back when I was a kid, we did this, that, and the other thing. And I, you know, I, I'm living in, in a house that I grew up in until I was 11 years old. And, and things are totally different today than what they were then. My mother had no fear at all of, of sending us kids out for the day, not knowing exactly where we were, but... She wasn't concerned about it because kids weren't being taken and turned into slaves back then. And we would go down in the woods that's back here and, and we'd play, you know, with the neighbor kids and none of our mothers were concerned about stuff. They, they, they weren't concerned like that because we were outside playing. In fact, you know, she'd put us out in the morning and, and we really weren't too welcome in the house in the afternoon. You want a drink of water? There's a hose out there. You want to go to the bathroom? Well, there's an outhouse out back. And, and today, you know, parents won't put their kids outside unless they're sitting out there with them. 
Do not be conformed to this age. Don't conform to the idea that, well, you know, the church has become more liberal, not the true church. Only the false church has become liberal. Well, pastor, I went to that church since I was a kid. If they accept something the Bible calls sin, I'm talking about the Word of God. If they accept something that the Bible calls sin, they are wrong. But you don't understand things are different today. Do not be conformed to this age. Sin is still sin. God hates sin. He doesn't hate sinners. He hates sin. And sin is still sin. And I don't care what you call it, it's still sin. I could begin to enumerate things, but I'm not going to. Uh, but one of, the, one of the sins that I really aggravates me is, you know, somebody that, that claims to be a Christian and then talks like the world. Dropping the F-bomb all the time and, and, and using foul language and being crude. Christians need to grow up. If you're a Christian, don't do that stuff. Amen. And, and you know, Lord, I repent for the times that I've spoken out of turn and said things wrong. I repent of it in Jesus' name. And you should also repent because it's not right. It's wrong. Well, Pastor, that's accepted in today's world. Do not be conformed. I mean, we're talking about the Word of God here. Do not be conformed. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. But that is not how you learned about the Messiah. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, the old self that's corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Righteousness and purity. Stay pure and righteous. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Who? Who's this talking about? It's talking about the church. Who is the church? You are. And he wants to make you holy. God said, be ye holy as I am holy. Pastor, that's just not possible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and your sins no longer are being recorded against you. But that doesn't mean that you can live any way you want to. That does not mean salvation, you know, salvation in Jesus and having your sins forgiven is not a license to sin. And I'm, I'm going to close with this verse. In the book of Titus, that's not one that you go to very often probably. The book of Titus Chapter 3, 
verses 3 through 8. Titus 3, verses 3 through 8. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. See, he's saying here in Titus, we, we were foolish too at one time, but once we got saved, we stopped that foolishness. And, and it's for you as a believer, you know, listen to your destiny that God has for you and stop all the foolishness if there's any in your life. And if there isn't, glory to God. Hallelujah. I know there's foolishness that happens in my life and I have to repent. You know, and, 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 and that's all you have to do, you just repent. What's repent mean? It means turn around and go the other direction. Make a 180 degree turn from what you were doing. Well, see, that's, that's how the blood of Jesus has cleansed you. Because when we do sin, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us. We call it, you know, the world calls it their conscience. But Holy Spirit begins to speak to us and we can stand repentant before Almighty God. We can boldly walk into his throne room anytime we need to or want to and spend time with him. You have a destiny and God will give it to you day by day by day by day. Your destiny, your destiny in God and your final destination is eternal life with him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.